Good morning, ladies. I know more people are coming in, and we're kind of a light crowd today, so if you want to move forward and we can all sit together and keep warm, that'd be good. Um, If we've not met, my name is Leah McQuinn, and I'm one of your substitute teaching leaders. We want to start by telling you that we are so happy that you are here, especially during the busyness of Thanksgiving week. And we want to wish every one of you an early happy Thanksgiving. Also, as a special treat, next week we will have an all-class fellowship. So you will meet in your groups the whole time, and the lecture will be posted on mybsf.org. So look forward to that. And with our really cold temperatures this past weekend, we thought it would be a good idea to talk about snow days. If at any time we make a decision to cancel for snow, you will hear from your group leader. She'll send you a Zoom link so that you can join your discussion group that morning at 9.30, as usual. On Snow Day's lecture will be recorded on mybsf.org, and there will be no student program or preschool program on Snow Day's. (laughs) Some people. (laughs) And lastly, well, One more thing, Christmas will be here in 33 days. Yay? (laughs) So, mark your calendars. Our last class day is December 7th, and then we will return January 4th. So make, make sure you have that down. And then lastly, before we um, get started, I'm sorry to share with you that one of our group members passed away yesterday. Uh, Frances Canty has been a part of our class for several years. So please pray, um, please join us as we pray for her family. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and open up our time together. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that you bless us. We thank you that you have provided your word, and through it you reveal yourself to us. We thank you that you have provided community here at BSF. Lord, we just ask for your presence to guide us through this time. Lord, I ask that that you would speak through me, that you would um, open the eyes and the ears of everyone in this room to hear from you. Lord, it is in your mighty, mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So when my daughter was little, one of the repeated books that we read together was the Jesus Storybook Bible. On the cover, it says, Every story whispers his name. The goal of the author, Sally Lloyd-Jones, was to show children that all the little stories in the Bible are telling one big story, the story of how God loves his children and how God becomes man in the person of Jesus to come rescue them. We are right in the middle of a lot of stories as we journey through 2 Kings. This week especially, we were introduced to a lot of kings and prophets, and we read about a lot of bloodshed and extreme suffering. And it would be easy for us to lose sight of the main character. God is at work in these pages, in these stories that we read this week. Even though the kings that we read about were wicked and led their people further and further away from God, God was still at work. Even though the majority of the people continued to rebel against God and pursue powerless idols, God had not forgotten his plan. He strategically placed people in their midst whom he would use to preserve his promises and his people. God's preserving power was present in the Old Testament, and it is present today. Every story that we read about this week involved real people with real names, and God knew and pursued each one 
by name. And by the way, even though God can pronounce each name perfectly, (laughs) I likely will not. (laughs) Um, Throughout the Jesus Storybook Bible, children and adults hear of God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. It is this steadfast love that that leads God to preserve his promises and his people. So as we dig into our passage, please remember that every story in scripture really does point to God's redemption plan. Every story whispers the name of Jesus. So today, let's fix our eyes on this anchoring truth. God faithfully and powerfully preserves his people, fulfilling his promises. God faithfully and powerfully preserves his people, fulfilling his promises. We will break this down into three divisions. The first division, preserving power through mercy. And with that, we'll look at 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, through chapter 8, through 6, verse 6. Our second division, preserving power through judgment. 2 Kings 8, 7 through 10, 36. And 2 Chronicles chapters 21 and 22. And then our third division, preserving power over evil. 2 Kings eleven fourteen, and 2 Chronicles 23 through 25. All right. Are you ready? Let's do this together. So please open your Bibles or your devices with me as we begin to look at our first division, preserving power through mercy. And we're going to open up to 2 Kings 6, verse 8. So in our opening scene, we were told of yet another war involving Aram and the northern kingdom of Israel. From the very beginning, we see the all-knowing, all-seeing God at work. The king of Israel at this time is King Joram. The text tells us that time and time again, God, in his providential care, would give Elisha, the prophet, eyes to see the unseen. God would alert Elisha of the plans of the enemy, and Elisha would then speak them to Joram, mercifully delivering Israel from the hands of their enemy. When the king of Aram became aware of Elisha's role, he confidently set horses and chariots out, and a strong force to capture Elisha. Beginning in verse 15, we see God's preserving power to deliver his people from fear. The servant of Elisha got up early and was overwhelmed by the enemy armies that had surrounded the city, and he went immediately to Elijah with his fear. Verse 16 gives us Elisha's response to him, "'Don't be afraid.'" Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. But Elijah did not stop there, thinking that his mere words would have any lasting impact on his servant's fear. Instead, he went to his master. He prayed to the Lord. But notice, he did not ask the Lord to miraculously intervene, as God had done before, and defeat the enemy before the eyes of his servant. Instead, he asked him to open his servant's eyes that he might see. Elisha asked the Lord to change his servant's perspective. Did you just try to imagine the response of Elisha's servant as the Lord did indeed allow him to see the hills full of horses horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha? No longer was he overwhelmed by fear, but instead he was overwhelmed by the reality of God's armies who surrounded them, protecting them. Before we move on, perhaps you or someone you love feels surrounded by forces that threaten to destroy you or capture you. In these situations, it's often difficult to see God. Your circumstances loom large before you and all around you. In those moments, let's cry out as Elisha did, asking God to give us 
or those we love, eyes to see beyond our circumstances to what he is doing on our behalf. Ask him to remind you of his promises to you that have the power to break through and defeat the darkest nights, the deepest fears, and the fiercest enemies. Back to our text. In verse 18, Elisha prayed again, and God did not wipe out the enemy. But as we saw, this did not mean that he had any less control over the enemy. Elisha asked him to blind the eyes of the enemy, and the Lord answered his prayer, providing Israel deliverance from their enemy. Elisha led the very troops that the king of Aram so confidently sent to capture him directly into Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. The troops that once surrounded Elisha are now surrounded. Next in our passage, we saw evidence again of God's great mercy as Elisha instructed Joram to spare his enemy and to set a feast before them, resulting in peace for a time. Unfortunately, verse 24 records that the king of Aram must have forgotten the kindnesses extended to his armies. These verses document not only an end of peace, but also a very hopeless time in Israel's history. But watch for the thread of God's preserving power, even as he offers deliverance from the hopelessness through some very unusual means. The king of Aram, Ben-Hadad, executed a full invasion of Israel. It was an ancient custom during times of war to lay siege upon a city. The thought was that if they were able to prevent business and trade from entering or leaving the city, that eventually the people of the city would starve or surrender. It's very hard to read of the desperation of the people at this time. As the siege continued, we are told that a donkey's head and dove's poo were sold for outrageous prices. But only the rich of the city could afford them. The poorest of the city resorted to eating their own children who had died of starvation. We're given a glimpse of King Joram's response to this dark, hopeless time, beginning in 2 Kings 6 26. As he walked along the walls of the city, encountering the devastation, he seems to portray a victim mentality of sorts. He expressed his grief regarding this suffering by tearing his robes, revealing a layer of sackcloth on his body. But he refused to acknowledge that he, as the king, and Israel as a whole, had been warned by God of the consequences of rejecting him through a covenant given to Moses. A covenant is a promise that God makes to an individual or to a group. Some covenants are conditional, excuse me, are unconditional, meaning they rest solely on God's faithfulness. Others are conditional, requiring a response from the people. The Mosaic covenant, also referred to as the Old Covenant, was conditional. The Israelites were aware if they obeyed God, he would bless them, but persistent disobedience would lead to consequences. Deuteronomy 28 details the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience. Specifically, Deuteronomy 28 verses 52 and 53 read as a vivid foretelling of our passage here in 2 Kings this week. It reads, They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you. 
Thanks be to God, as Christians, we no longer live under the Mosaic Covenant. Jesus fully obeyed and fulfilled the requirements of the law for us. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not by our own efforts or works. But when we persist in sin, we can be sure that the hound of heaven will pursue us with consequences to draw us back to him. Israel, including the current king, Joram, had repeatedly and blatantly rejected God and the Mosaic Covenant consequences. So this famine was a powerful warning from God to repent and to return to him. But the hard-hearted Joram sought to kill the prophet of God, just like his mother Jezebel sought to kill Elijah. But again, Elisha was given eyes to see the unseen, and he prepared for Joram's messenger. The words of the king in verse 33 stood out to me as I studied this passage. This disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? I had to stop and ask myself, is there a circumstance in my life where I have tired in waiting upon the Lord? And how has that circumstance caused me to doubt the truths of God's word? How have I turned to someone or something else as my source of hope in the face of hopeless circumstances? 2 Kings chapter 7 opens with Elisha speaking a word of hope from the Lord. He said within 24 hours the famine would be lifted. This siege and resulting famine had been going on for some time. How could they possibly believe that relief would come so quickly? The officer of the king mocked the prophet and proclaimed his unbelief and the power of the sovereign God. Beginning in verse 3 of chapter 7, we read the dramatic unfolding of God's deliverance of his people from the hopelessness of the famine through four surprising characters, four unnamed lepers. These lepers basically decided they had nothing to lose. They were starving. As lepers, they would normally eat garbage. But during a time of of siege and and famine, it was even worse. So at dusk, they went into the camp of the Arameans, ready to surrender, but no one was there. What they did not know is that the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, and they had fled in the dusk, abandoning their tents and all their belongings. The undeserving, unclean lepers received the abundant provision of the Lord as they ate and drank and took of the silver, the gold, and the clothing that was before them. But their conscience provoked them to share the good news of their discovery with the royal palace. This scene reminded me of a phrase that I have heard a missionary from our church share on more than one occasion. As he describes one of his greatest joys in life, he says, I am just one beggar helping another beggar find food. These lepers got me to thinking, I too was once like them, unclean and undeserving, but God... God opened my eyes to my sin and rescued me from the consequences of my sin through the person of Jesus. What is our response to the good news that we have been given as believers? Do we keep it to ourselves or do we share it with others who need to know? Verse 16 tells us that when the people heard of the food and the treasures found by the lepers, they went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. Not only does Elisha's prophecy about the flour and the barley come to pass, but so does his word to the king's official who doubted the power of God. He was trampled in the gateway, and he died. As we have seen again and again in our study, what God says will happen will happen. 2 Kings chapter 8 reconnects us to the Shunammite woman. During the seven-year famine, Elisha directed her to another country. She now returns, asking the the king to restore her land. 
What a contrast we see here between the king who tired of waiting for the Lord, his official who doubted the Lord, and this woman. She had obeyed the word of the Lord through Elisha, and she had waited upon the Lord. The king restored her land, and in this we see that in his preserving power, God rewards those who trust him. He does not forget his people. And this leads us to our first main truth. God mercifully preserves his people for his greater purposes. God mercifully preserves his people for his greater purposes. His preserving power may come in the form of consequences to deliver us from the temptation to sin and to draw us back to himself. It may come in the form of divine deliverance from a specific trial. But we can be certain that whatever form, it is dispensed through the hands of a good, good father. How am I? How are you responding to current circumstances? Are we responding in fear as Elisha's servant? Responding as the king, looking to blame others for his circumstances? Are we responding as the king's official, doubting the power of God? Or responding as the Shunammite woman, waiting and trusting for the Lord as our source of hope? Now we will move to our second division, preserving power through judgment. Before we open to our current passage, we need to remind ourselves of the words of the Lord as he gave his weary servant Elijah his job description of sorts. Back in 1 Kings 19, verses 15 and 8 to 18, when he told him to go back and anoint Hazael, king over Aram, Jehu, king over Israel, and to anoint Elisha to succeed him as prophet. God told Elijah that these three would be his instruments of judgment. But in verse 18, God promised to leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that had not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that had not kissed him. These 7,000 have been referred to in our recent passages as the sons of the prophets. It's clear from this portion of scripture that God may graciously delay judgment for a time, but he will not postpone judgment forever. In chapter 8, verse 7, we see God's judgment begins. Elisha went to Damascus, and Hazael came to inquire of him about the illness of the king of Aram. Elisha replied, but then he began to weep, because he knew that the Lord would use Hazael as an instrument of judgment against Israel. He went on to tell him that he would be the new king of Aram. The next day, Hazael murdered Ben-Hadad and began his reign. In verse 16, the text abruptly shifts to the kingdom of Judah and God's preserving judgment there as well. King Jehoshaphat and his son Jehoram reign as co-regents over the southern southern kingdom for a period of five years. At the death of Jehoshaphat, Jehoram took the throne. Jehoram was married to Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. 2 Chronicles 21.4 gives us additional insight into this wicked heart of Jehoram as it records his brutal killing of his own brothers. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but 2 Kings 8.19 is significant. It reads, Nevertheless, For the sake of his servant David, the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah. He had promised to maintain a lamp for David and his descendants forever. Jehoram's son, Ahaziah, ruled after him, and he followed in the ways of the house of Ahab. We are told in 2 Chronicles 22.3 that his mother, Athaliah, encouraged him to act wickedly. Ahaziah joined his uncle Joram, the king of Israel, in a battle against Hazael of Aram. 
As we read, the battle did not go well for King Joram. He was wounded and returned to Jezreel to recover, and Ahaziah went to visit him there. 2 Kings chapter 9 opened with the prophet Elijah summoning a man to go to Ramoth Gilead, the site of the battle between Israel and Aram. He was to anoint Jehu, the commanding officer in Israel's army, as king over Israel, with specific instructions in verses 7 to 10 to bring God's promised judgment against Israel. He was called to destroy those who remained alive in the house of Ahab and was given details of the disastrous end of Jezebel. In verses 14 through 37, we saw the zeal of Jehu in fulfilling God's command. He first encountered both Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, who rode out to meet him in their chariots, thinking as he was the commander, that he had news of the battle. By God's design, they met at the plot of ground that had belonged to Naboth, but had been stolen by Ahab and Jezebel. And it was here that Jehu called out the wickedness and idolatry of Israel and shot Joram between the shoulders. And in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 21, his body was thrown in this field. Ahaziah tried to flee, but was also wounded and later died. Second Chronicles tells us that through Ahaziah's visit to Joram, God brought about Ahaziah's downfall. Jehu's next target was the wick wicked queen Jezebel. Her eunuchs willingly participated in Jehu's mission to destroy her by throwing her out of the window where Jehu waited in his chariot to drive over her body. Later, they, when they went to bury her body, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands, fulfilling again the words given to Ahab through Elijah. But Jehu's mission of destruction was not over yet. He ordered the extermination of 70 sons of the house of Ahab remaining in Samaria. 2 Kings 10:11 tells us that he killed everyone in Jezreel who remained of the house of Ahab, as well as his chief men, close friends, and his priests. With equally dramatic zeal, he also destroyed Baal worship in Israel. But 2 Kings 10, 28 tells us he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, which was the worship of the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. Even though he had rid the nation of much of its wicked influence as instructed by God, Jehu struggled to rid the wicked influence of the idols of his own heart. He was motivated by selfish ambition, which led him to go beyond the Lord's specific instructions. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to God, and so he failed to turn Israel back to God. This leads us to our second main truth. God powerfully judges the wicked to preserve his people. God powerfully judges the wicked to preserve his people. God may seem slow to us in judging sin and evil, but we have learned that his delays reflect his compassion in providing opportunities for repentance. This passage provides more evidence that he is always at work to accomplish his purposes and he will do them in his perfect timing. It's very likely that many of us here today have suffered pain from another. What hurt have you resisted in surrendering to God? I want to remind you of 2 Kings 9-7 where God speaks a promise in saying, I will avenge. So as we face hurts in our lives, let's look to the Lord, the one who sees our hurts and entrusts them to him and wait upon him to work in a way that only he can in his perfect timing. We'll now move into our third division, preserving power over evil. 
In 2 Kings chapter 11, there is a dramatic shift to the southern kingdom of Judah. King Ahaziah has been killed by Jehu. As the throne is vacant, the lamp that God promised to maintain for David and his descendants back in chapter 8 seems to be flickering at best. The darkness of evil threatening to overwhelm it. The wicked Athaliah is committed to murdering even her own grandchildren to destroy the dynasty of David. We must pause and consider the significance of this moment in history. This is David's dynasty through which God had promised to bring the Messiah. If all of Ahaziah's sons had been killed, that would have left God's promise to David unfulfilled. We spoke earlier of the Mosaic Covenant, which was conditional. The Davidic Covenant is unconditional, meaning that the promise rests solely on God's faithfulness and does not depend on the obedience of anyone else. God promised that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David and that he would establish a kingdom from which he will reign forever. What God says will happen, will happen. And in this passage, we see God was working to faithfully unfold his perfect plan. God invited two faithful people to join him in this plan who were committed to protecting and preserving the lineage of David, even at great personal risk. Jehosheba, the sister of Ahaziah, acting in quiet obedience to the Lord, courageously hid one-year-old Joash, the son of Ahaziah, so that he would not be killed. He remained in hiding in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah, the queen mother, reigned on the throne of Judah. Let's talk a little bit more about Jehoshaphat. One commentary that I read contrasted her with the Grinch who stole Christmas, saying that she was the lady who saved Christmas. So why don't we have more Jehoshabas in our children's program? <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking, like, why don't we talk more about Jehoshaba? Anyway, <laughs> back to our text. Very few knew of this hidden boy. The rest of Judah endured the cruel reign of Athaliah with no hope. Did they feel abandoned by God? Had God forgotten them? Had he forgotten his promises to them? But at God's appointed time, Jehoiada, the priest, and the husband of Jehoshaphat, presented the seven-year-old Joash to the crowds who had gathered. With a copy of the covenant in Joash's little hand, Jehoiada crowned him and anointed him as king. The Lord had not forgotten them. He kept his covenant promise. Great was the joy of the people. The wicked reign of Athaliah ended as she was put to death. Evil is no match for God's preserving power. King Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years Jehoiada instructed him, including restoring the temple. But after the death of Jehoiada, Joash abandoned God and instituted idol idol worship. The young king, who had been preserved and protected by the powerful intervention of God, did not finish well. Back in the northern kingdom, 2 Kings chapter 13 tells us that Jehoahaz took the throne after his father, Jehu, and did evil, provoking the Lord to anger. He sought the Lord's favor, and God listened and provided a deliverer for them because he had compassion on the people of Israel under the evil oppression of Aram. However, they wasted the grace and mercy that God had shown them, and they did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam. 
And with that legacy, Jehoahaz, son, Jehoash, Jehoash, I think, took the throne and continued to do evil. The scripture says little about his reign other than a significant encounter that he had with the dying Elisha, who gave him final instructions, mercifully still prompting him to trust in God's provision and victory over their enemy, Aram. Meanwhile, in Judah, Amaziah succeeded Joash. Like his father, he did what was right for a time, but his pride and allegiance to Edomite gods led him and the kingdom to suffer. But our covenant-keeping God did not abandon Judah. A second king by the name of Jeroboam took the throne in Israel. He also did evil, but through his reign we see God's heart of compassion once again, restoring the boundaries of Israel. And this leads us to our final main truth. God is stronger than any power that opposes him. God is stronger than any power that opposes him. Psalm 33, 11 says, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. I want to end our time reflecting on Elisha. God preserved Elisha to the end, equipping him to be an instrument of his grace, his compassion and truth to the northern kingdom of Israel and to kings who refused to repent. God saw his faithful servant's compassion for his people and obedience to his call. And even when it seemed that all hope was lost, God raised up an Elijah. God raised up a Jehoshaba to preserve his people and his purposes. And he does so today. So as you go and celebrate Thanksgiving... There may be people around your table that do not yet know Jesus as Savior or those who just might need to be reminded of God's promises in the midst of heart. Speak words of life to them. God really is stronger than any power that opposes him. Let's worship him together in song as our closing prayer.